Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to um, room number 10, cell D. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for joining us for the Global Information Society Watch Book Launch 2018, special issue or special edition on community networks. We will be starting with a welcome and, well, first of all, my name is Kathleen Diga. I was the GIS Watch coordinator for 2018 alongside um, Rox, uh, Roxana Bassi, who's, I believe, might be online uh, remotely. And uh, I will be helping to uh, moderate this session. And we have our remote moderator, uh, Sebastian Becker Castellero. Um, so anyone who is uh, participating remotely, we welcome you uh, as well. If we, there are any authors who are remotely participating, they can also um, let us know that they're online and participate. So we will start with a welcome um, and a presentation on the uh, broader uh, Global Information Society Watch uh, project from our, from uh, Chat Garcia Ramillo from Association for Progressive Communication, our, ex our executive director. Chat, can I hand it over to you? Thank you. So every year at IGF, this is the one event that we really look forward to. So this is our, this is the 12th Kiswatch edition. It's been uh, it's been massive, this undertaking. We were not so as formal, we've never had such a formal room, I have to say. But look, this is really, I wanna welcome the um, Giswatch community who have been with us for the last 12 years and also friends who are here today. We're really happy that you can join us. Now, the Global Information Society Watch 20 um, is started in 2007. It was really an attempt for us to look at monitoring the implementation of agreements that was made at the World Summit on Information Society. We have had a number of themes um, from ranging from access to libraries, to sexual rights, to gender, to surveillance, climate change. And these themes have come out of um, really the concerns of civil society. And it is that we wanna bring diverse civil society views in relation to looking at um, what has been done, what is being done, what is not being done, what are the issues, what is it that we need to look out for. So it's a very important contribution, we believe, in really monitoring the implementation of agreements, especially from a policy framework. And we do have a very diverse community of um, uh, writers, authors, who bring these perspectives, and we're very thankful for that collaboration. So this, for, I just wanna let you know that since, um, 20, since 2007, let me get my my uh, <laughs> statistics straight, we've had 510 country reports on 15, 16, and I think there's some special edition, so it would have been about 23 different topics. Quite an, un quite a, an achievement, I believe. Um, and, and this year, this year's theme of community networks in, is an addition to that, and um, we will talk about that a bit more. Um, also this year, we released a 10-year, sort of like a review of the of um, GISWatch, and uh, written by Alan Finlay, who is our editor, and we'd like to thank also Alan, because he's not with us here. Um, the review provided an overview of trends in civil society perspective and not what needs to be done. So in a way, it's sort of like also looking at ourselves at the, an evaluation and assessment, so that we can it will help us also think more about how do we want to move, um, how do we want to shape the Global Information Society Watch to be much more effective. So really, I just want to welcome you all and thank you for being here and especially to our authors who really contributed for this year's um, uh, edition and also to, to, to thank the IDRC, the International Development Research Center of Canada for their support for APCs, APC and our partners, Community Networks Project, and for this edition. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chad, for that introduction. I will now uh, hand over the microphone to Valeria Benta Court, our manager for the communi Communications and Information Policy Program at APC. She will be providing an overview of the current uh, 2018 edition. Thank you, Kathleen. As Chad has mentioned, uh, we really look uh, forward every year to the launching event of GIS Watch, and this year is of particular relevance. We are quite excited about it. I hope that you all have in your hands the copy of the, of, of the GIS Watch. Uh, so one year ago, we started by like, assuming that community networks um, are initiatives built, owned, managed, operated by members of a community in a participatory and open manner. But we wanted to take that as a starting point, as a kind of working definition, um, to, to be able to dig a little bit more and to have a deeper comprehension of what the technical, the social, the political, the sustainability, the sustainability financial, and also organizational challenges and particularities of these initiatives, of these community networks are. We also wanted to better understand what the necessary circumstances, including obviously the regulatory circumstances are for enabling the development, the strengthening, the scaling of, of these initiatives, because based on the conviction that the network, uh, community net networks are a quite viable model, perhaps the most viable model to provide affordable connectivity to unserved areas and also based on the conviction that they can truly contribute to um, achieve digital inclusion. So uh, that, that, the, that are the motivations behind this, this edition. Um, we also wanted to understand uh, in, a, in a better way how community networks have faced and have overcome specific challenges um, and have developed resilience capacities as well and towards consolidating their role, not only locally, nationally, but also how they are actually building um, a national, regional, and global movement ar around, the, um, around the development and, the, and around the, the, the value that these communities bring to the, to the localities. So this, this edition is a combination of thematic reports and also country chapters. So in terms of the thematic reports, it, it provides not only an historical overview and historical analysis of the evolution of community networks. In addition, uh, you will find here uh, chapters that have to do with the technology options that community networks have, also the legal frameworks in which uh, community networks um, should exist and flourish and also approaches to financial sustainability that you can find in the, in, in the, in the networks in different contexts, the role that community networks play uh, in the broader access ecosystem as well. And I'm sure you, that you will find quite interesting to also look at the chapter on feminist infrastructure, what it means and how community uh, networks are an opportunity to look at issues of diversity and uh, how we approach also uh, issues of autonomy and agency. And not less important, uh, you will also find uh, a chapter on how community networks change the paradigm of um, culture sharing, how we share culture and how we create local content. So I'm sure you will also find it fascinating to read about the interplay between the meanings and the narratives that are embedded in the community networks and the power relations they contain and produce, uh, as well as the, as the need to transform them in a way that the, you know, counter, uh, counter, counteracts and, 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 and create, I mean, a different conditions to not perpetuate inequalities at the level of the, of the communities. So um, I, want, I want to mention that some the, the, of these reports draw on research that has been conducted in the framework of a two years project led by Carlos Rey Moreno. 
uh, and implemented by the Association for Progressive Communication and Rhizomatica in collaboration with Internet Society and with the support of the of the IDRC, as Chad mentioned. So you will see that as, uh, this, in this edition in some, in some way consolidates that research as well. Um, so you will find 40, 43 country reports um, covering a wide range of countries like Georgia, Nepal, South Africa, Argentina, Mexico, Honduras, Portugal, Myanmar, Germany, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So as you can see, uh, the country reports tells, uh, tell us about the reality in which community networks exist in, exist in a variety of, of contexts and countries. So the countries will illustrate, you will see the diversity of, of these um, realities and also the different objectives they respond in, in political and in practical terms. So um, you will find how various ownership models have profiled and featured in this edition, as well as the governance systems the community have adopt, adopted to manage the networks, how they relate to the particular visions of self-determination, uh, and not only in terms of how they connect to the outside world, but also how they use technology to respond to a specific local development and practical needs. So when going over the reports, I'm sure that you will confirm that um, the community networks differ in their motivations. They also differ in their purposes, their politics, their stakeholders, the size, their scope, their models. And we really believe that this edition um, really sets a good basis for a much more comprehensive understanding of the similarities, the differences, and the challenges, and also the trends that the evolution of community networks are moving us to. So overall, overall uh, we believe that both the thematic reports and the country reports uh, really deepen the understanding of the issues that are critical for the development and the strengthening of the global movement of community networks. And the value of this edition is that it, only, it not only addresses the various aspects that I have already mentioned, but also provides some substantive hints um, to understand the actual and the potential collective power of community to bring about social change. And I think this is uh, where the, the, the value of this what you realize. So um, uh, we are very, um, um, we, we would be very happy, uh, very happy to receive your feedback, your comments, how useful you, you feel this edition is going to be. And, let me just close. I'm from Ecuador, and one of the reports is for, for, from, it's profiling a very small um, community network in the country. And I was very struck by the words of the, of the author of this, of this report, that he had, stated, uh, he had stated that our network exists because we want it to exist. We build it, we maintain it, we use it, and sometimes we break it. We argue about it, we insult it when it goes slower than we like or cuts off entirely, and we get frustrated about it. But mostly it works and we are thankful. So let me close with the uh, words of the author of the Ecuadorian report. Well, thank you very much, uh, Valeria. Great uh, quote from the Ecuador uh, chapter. And uh, thank you also for providing the overview of the issues that will be co covered uh, as you go through the report and providing the summary of the, the regional and, sorry, national uh, reports. Um, I would like to now um, uh, move on to uh, acknowledge some of the authors who are here uh, at the IGF. Um, there have been quite a few workshops um, in the last past two days and the third day tomorrow um, that speak to community networks. And uh, I think we can take this uh, unique opportunity to hear from, from each of them um, who are here uh, about uh, their chapter. So what I'd like to first start, I'll ask um, uh, Carlos Ray Moreno to, to start us off as he uh, was one of the co-authors for the introduction. And then what I'll do is ask um, authors to raise their hand and I will um, ask them to then speak, um, uh, state their name, um, their organization, their, the name of their, their country, and uh, a few words about their chapter or what it's meant for them to produce um, this chapter. So if I could first uh, hand it over to Carlos for the first uh, 
introduction. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, the, the, for me, it was a surprise. I've learned quite a lot through through the through the process of this of this book, and starting from the introduction itself, that I'm only one of the co-authors. Steve Song and Leandro also contributed to the chapter here in the in the room. And, and the first thing that I didn't know, that is how the book starts, is about community networks predate the commercial interest, internet. Sorry, They started uh, with, with email and ballot, balloting board systems in the 80s that were adopted by a lot of um, enthusiasts and social activists. Actually, I didn't, learn, I didn't know that, 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 that APC has its roots in connecting all these social activist organizations and network them with systems that allowed, allowed that to do so in the, in the global south. But we call this chapter the rise and fall and rise of community networks because in the 80s there were quite a lot of many of these systems, but then in the 90s there were very few of them because the commercial inter internet came and, and most of them couldn't keep up with the, with the technology and, and the models. But then at the beginning of the century again, uh, with something that one company, Linksys, uh, did the uh, use uh, open, open source uh, software in the, in the router, that uh, forced them to, to release that software and allowed many people to start playing around with that, with that router and creating the beginning of mess networks of actually tweaking and hacking uh, uh, this, this hardware and creating networks and, and, and plugging new antennas and, and extending connectivity from wherever there was. And, um, yeah, that was the beginning of the community wireless networks movement that had been taken over in many, many places. And, and many pilots and many community networks appear and, and in, 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 in many places of the world. But then, at the end of that very same century, I mean, at the, at the end of the, of, the, of the 2000s, the mobile network operators and the paradigm of them being the only one able to, to provide connectivity everywhere affordably kind of took over. And some of these wireless networks actually couldn't keep up, and some of them stopped their operations. Some of them still operate since those days, but they are, they are, most of them also, also disappear. And, and now we are, we are back in the last four or five years where there is a whole rebirth, especially lately where the mobile network paradigm has kind of plateaued, and there are signs that it's not going to be able to connect more, many more people than the ones that are connected already. And, and there is quite a lot of interest and in all the sessions in this IEF, in last year IGF, in many other conferences all over, uh, show that, so that community networks are becoming recognized as a, as, a, as a paradigm that can actually connect the unconnected affordably and allow communities to actually provide and self-provide access to themselves. So, so yeah, I think um, it was very interesting to, to learn about this story. I think we are now at a moment where I think community networks can make it so they don't fall again. I think uh, the, the knowledge and the, and, the, and the enthusiasm and the, and the resources that we are all putting into this to make this happen, to support different organizations that are trying and, and taking this model forward, there is quite a lot of proof that they can be sustainable. There are quite a lot of proof that they, they contribute to a lot of the sustainable development goals, not only infrastructure, but employment. There are connections with policy. There are opening in regulatory frameworks that, that we talked about yesterday. There is, anyway, so I think there is an opportunity for them to be sustained and don't fall again. And I think it's on all of us to make that happen. So thank you for coming and to learning about this topic. Thank you, Carlos. I wonder if any of the other co-authors of the introduction would like to um, add to that. Okay, um, I will then uh, move to um, the, th uh, the other thematic um, authors. Um, let's have uh, Leandro uh, speak on behalf of his chapter on um, the technologies. Well, um, so you will find in that chapter uh, that there are many options uh, today. Um, uh, all technologies in a way that enable communication has, have been explored by community networks and, and used in innovative ways, which maybe were predicted or not. Uh, maturity is, is uh, it's nice. Um, uh, and um, using the trendy terms of uh, generations, we, we find uh, uh, the speeds on the range of uh, megabits per second, like uh, 
3G or, or hundreds of megabits per second, which is 4G networks, I mean, wired and wireless. And, and now there, are st there are already appearing some um, <coughs> fiber-based and even wireless-based uh, 5G networks, which are run at uh, the gigabit speeds. Um, you will find uh, mentions about, um, of course, Wi-Fi-based uh, wireless networks. Um, also, you will find some support for mobility, mobi mobile access, um, options for fiber networks. So there are many uh, possibilities. You can combine them for the access and for the backhaul. Um, and, um, and also in the, in the article, we mentioned like um, hardware options, software options, and in, in general, the importance of openness to enable um, enable communities and the individuals to um, experiment, to find out, to uh, adapt them, to localize them, to use it, um, and finally, well, to enable everyone to connect themselves, which is the, the, the right point. So uh, there are many details, but you, this is kind of uh, an overview of the schema of the article. Thank you, Leandra. I'm actually going through the authors of the thematic uh, reports in order. So uh, for for the for this um, part, and then I'll ask the the country um, authors or region authors to also then speak, and ask them to raise their hand. So the next author um, in the thematic reports is Eric Herta. Is she, I, I, yeah. Hi. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to. Um, to be here and uh, very happy of having this this document brought on because well the, the richness of the document it's it's amazing and um, just a few words I am part of Rhizomatica and Redes so we are two organizations that work together in the supporting and implementing community networks mainly uh, in Mexico and Latin America and uh, well um, uh, one of the ideas of building this chapter, this chapter is part of uh, for, uh, a deeper study that we have finished just uh, a pair of weeks ago for, with ISOC. So this was an introductory part that is attending uh, one of the main needs for the uh, community networks that is how should be the regulation of community networks? No? And the main question sometimes it was, uh, do we need a license or do we, uh, or don't we need a license? Or when do we need a license? What should we do? And there are questions that not only the, the community networks does for itself, but also the government does. No? And uh, this study, it's like uh, the beginning of, of a deeper study that uh, wants to help either community networks to um, allow them to do, um, to negotiate with the government a proper regulation, and also for the governments that are interested in implementing community networks, which uh, to know which regulation to apply. So the first uh, part is, uh, that is the one that is in this study, is the uh, legal nature of community networks. And then we, we find that, well, there are community networks that Actually, in the legal system, they work as a private network. I mean, it's, they're actually a community network, but sometimes the legal system doesn't recognize that sort of things. That, uh, that they, the, 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 but they can fit in the box of private networks, so sometimes they don't, they don't even need a license, no? because there are people just organizing by themselves. That it could be similar to, to the people that has interconnection in a building and those need uh, a license. Sometimes they, they do need, and uh, well, it, it, in, in this chapter, you can see uh, these parameters when, when do they need a license. So, so I invite you also to keep, to, to write the, uh, the chapter, but all the book too, and also uh, the, um, to be, uh, pay attention to the, to the document that uh, have just been finished and will be presented by, by ISOC. And uh, we already have it in, in our website, part of this study. And it's, it's not only the, the legal <coughs> nature of the community network, also the fundamental rights that are in the international legal system for, 
for community networks, and a study of the regulation in Latin America of community networks. So with this package, we hope that uh, each uh, group of each people in, the, in their countries can uh, negotiate and contribute with the government to, to develop their own regulation. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eric, and also for giving us uh, a bit more exposure around the legal frameworks and other work that um, is ongoing from this book chapter around um, for legal frameworks and community networks. Um, can I please ask Steve to then speak on community networks and telecommunication regulation? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, the, the history of telecommunication telecommunications regulation is rooted in uh, technology and investment on a scale that could only be conceived of by governments. So millions and millions of dollars poured into national networks that, uh, um, that were in the strategic national interests of governments, but which um, you know, w was something that you couldn't depend on the private sector to, to invest in. And, um, that has uh, slowly changed uh, to, the, to the point where now the private sector also builds out you know, um, these kind of uh, large-scale national, international networks. But we've gone through another change now in the last, say, 10 to 15 years, where instead of having to build every aspect of the network as a telecommunications operator, the international backhaul, national backhaul networks, middle mile, last mile, handsets, uh, which was you know, typically, if you wanted to enter a market, that's what you had to solve. You had to solve all of those problems. Now those are becoming uh, disaggregated, and the ability to deliver um, you know, state-of-the-art telecommunication services by a small operator uh, is, is now within reach of, uh, of anyone. So um, thanks to the spread of fiber optic infrastructure, uh, we now have a broadband as effectively a public good in that it is, a, it is essentially non-rival. There is so much uh, fiber capacity now that um, it can be shared without actually disadvantaging anyone. The cost of wireless technologies which connect the, the last mile has gone from you know, $250,000 to build a base station down to a few thousand dollars to build um, a, a GSM or an LTE base station. Wi-Fi infrastructure, which has gone from a commodity device that um, um, you know, might be deployed in a, in a home or in a hotel, is now delivering broadband infrastructure of um, hundreds of megabits and gigabits per second over kilometers. Uh, for uh, a few thousand dollars. So now we live in a world where anyone with a modest amount of resources and some ambition can build their own commercial, well not commercial, but, but professional um, internet infrastructure. However, the regulatory frameworks are largely stuck in that age when large-scale monolithic telcos were chiefly the thing that needed to be regulated and managed. What we need now is a shift in regulation that recognizes the potential for communities, for municipalities, for individuals to build their own infrastructure and create an enabling environment for them to flourish. We've seen amazing stories this year of, uh, of community networks that have thrived largely in spite of the regulatory environments that they exist in. What we need now is a one, you know, is a basically a big bag of sort of, you know, a fertilizer now to, to help them uh, to grow further. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> We will now move to uh, Nicola Bidwell, who presents the chapter uh, titled Community Networks, Stories and Power. Hi. <laughs> uh, so my chapter is a preliminary analysis of the five of the six rural community networks in the Global South that I studied this year as part of the local access project and as in my role as 
social and gender impact facilitator. So they were in Asia, Latin America and Africa. I actually went to one more after the chapter was uh, finished. Um, so the chapter is uh, an analysis, a very preliminary analysis uh, of over 220 people that I interviewed in focus groups or individually, some of whom are here um, and many, many others aren't. So I pick out some narratives that repeated in the community networks and suggest that how we, if we think, reflect on those, we, um, how they reproduce some power relations that we possibly don't want to rep reproduce. And by thinking about it, how we can inspire new kinds of meanings uh, that benefit community networks for all their members and for all their users and for all the people that don't currently use them but could. So I'm just going to pick out a few of them here. One of them is um, the value of human connectedness. Often we're so busy arguing about how our community network benefits development and sustainability and all sorts of other things that we need to argue the case for. We don't think that human connectedness has an intrinsic worth. Um, another narrative looks at the skills that are involved in community networks and that we're sudden, sometimes hidden or we don't look at how important they are. And these often, uh, the way that we hide them or don't think about them, inherits from the telecommunications narratives that we're kind of trying to avoid in the first place. So in particular, some coordinative skills and some of the smaller physical and care work that women often participate in their community network, but isn't quite so heroic as running up a tower or setting up a satellite. Um, and so the final narrative, and I don't think I'm ever going to change the word community network to community mesh work, but I'd like to uh, provoke people to think about when we think about a network, we tend to think of it as a static thing with nodes and uh, things in place that don't move along. But community networks, most of the work is the work of human lives that move along and have paths, that interconnect and diverge. They're lives that are lived, um, and a community network emerges out of those, um, that process of going along. Um, and I think that final narrative of mesh works rather than networks can actually be very useful for us for, to recreate new meanings, um, to recognize that we don't have to inherit all of these um, uh, narratives from telecommunications and from development speak, that um, the meanings are local and different, and different places in the world and different communities in the world have different takes on what autonomy means, what self-determination means, what emancipation means, or what decoloniality might mean. And thinking about that can give life to those things and make our networks more resilient because they reflect that. Thank you very much, Nick. I will now move on to Deborah Prado. Where is she? I cannot see. Oh, there she is. And uh, she'll be presenting a short um, discussion on feminist infrastructure and community networks. Oh, well, hello. Uh, it's great to talk after Nick because I believe our chapters are connected somehow. Uh, in our chapter, is, uh, we are in five women authors, and we consider that the operation of a community network uh, implies relationship between a multiplicity of individuals and groups that are not affected at the same way by social technical systems. So uh, we want to consider all the knowledge that uh, we already have produced about feminist infrastructure and feminist technologies uh, to think uh, to get together and think what's changed when you make a community network consider a feminist infrastructure, a feminist perspective, uh, and how can we make our community networks more diverse and more welcome and safety for different groups and people. So that was uh, our main interest. In. 
So we want to, with this, think beyond uh, digital inclusion, but also think the power relations, autonomy, and agents, and women agents especially. Uh, we look at three experiences in Brazil. Uh, one of them is Casa dos Meninos, in a free translation would be House of Boys, but it's a bad name because it's a community network managed by women. <laughs> And in the south of Sao Paulo city, uh, it's an um, amazing experience in Brazil, ma managed by women. Uh, we looked to Fuxico, uh, and the author, uh, which write this part, was Diana Araujo, that is one of the women in the management of this community network. We looked to Fuxico, and Carla Jenks wrote this part. It's a portable device made by Brazilian women. It's a heavily adaptation of a pirate box, and we consider uh, it as a feminist network of a single rotor. <laughs> and we looked to Rádio Mulheres Pancararu, considering that uh, the Spectrum uh, technology, it's also uh, a community network, a radio network, uh, in Pernambuco State, and Bruna Zanoli, who was involved uh, in making this, this experience, wrote this, this experience in our chapter. And looking for the whole three experience, we noticed that uh, when we want to build a more diverse community network, we have to plan the time and the method and considering these differences and considering local knowledge and local daily life, uh, as Nikki was speaking, and co consider the difference that they are in grassroots. And we also uh, want to, to pay attention uh, to bring something that the feminists, very feminist movements uh, already bring to us that don't use women as a label to raise our difference. And we want to avoid that community network to become a label uh, to erase uh, difference and power relations in internal uh, experience. So that is it. Uh, it was a great uh, experience to us uh, to exchange with all of you and to have the opportunity to bring together so many authors <laughs> and so many different experiences and try to find some commons and try to offer some perspectives on how to make uh, our network more welcome to women especially, but also consider gender, race, class, and another intersectional difference. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And our last um, thematic chapter, we have uh, Nicolas Seixanis, and he's presenting on decentralizing culture, the challenge of local content in community networks. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so I'm Nicolas from Altermundi, from Argentina. Um, we wrote uh, this chapter on, on local content. Um, it was quite a challenge. It was very interesting for us to, to be invited to, to talk about this matter. Um, we focused on a bit on the history of what we have been doing in community networks regarding local content over, over the years. We think that uh, the, the th things have changed from the internet where we started, from the internet we have now. And one of the changes that impacts more in what we are doing is that um, if we look at the, at the process, or if we look at the internet uh, divided in, in levels, like we talk here in the chapter about the, a physical layer, a, a logical layer, and a cultural layer, um, we discuss about the, how in the current state Community networks are deploying uh, in the physical layer, they are deploying infrastructure. So we are getting uh, communication to the homes with infrastructure. Uh, and people is also 
in some way participating uh, what we call it the cultural layer they are they have their whatsapp groups and the posts about the political fights on facebook and other uh, and other platforms but that layer which we are we are calling here the, the logical layer, which are the, the platforms that support how we are sharing our culture and what we want to say. Uh, we don't have control over that. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting fight. It's like, uh, what are we doing about that? No, I, have, I heard many times people from different places that are deploying community networks and they sometimes stop to think, are we just bringing more uh, junk food <laughs> to our communities? No. Uh, so how, what are we doing to reverse this? How, how do we work to reverse this? And we, in this chapter, we, we do a parallel with uh, food production, no, on how uh, if we were uh, if we were producing food and we lost control of of one of the layers of the technology layer, which in that case would mean uh, our seeds, our okay, okay. So our supplies, our seeds, our techniques. If they were controlled by an external concentrated agent, um, we would we would we would not accept this in our fight for food sovereignty. We would fight against this. Yes, uh, but with community networks, we are not so clear about it. No. Uh, so well, we propose that we need to put more thought, more resources, and more work on recovering this layer and creating, again, recreating our tools in this new scenario. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Nico. We'll now move to the country and regional um, chapters, region chapters. So um, if authors uh, can raise their hand, because I don't know each and every one of you, and um, you'll have a chance to state your name, organization, country, or region, and a few words uh, about uh, your chapter. Um, can I have some of the hands of the authors? The, okay, let's start um, this side. So one, one, two, and Peter. Okay, three. Okay, Julian. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Julian Casas Buenas. I'm from uh, Colnodo, an APC member. And we wrote a, a chapter for Colombian community management for the deployment of community networks. Uh, this uh, was written uh, with uh, Lilian Chamorro that uh, maybe uh, most of you know, uh, especially from Latin America. She has been very active in coordinating the, the community network, networks uh, project uh, in Colnodo. And also with the collaboration of uh, Olga Paz um, uh, which is also um, a partner uh, from our organization. Uh, the chapter um, describes uh, what's um, the situation in Colombia um, in, with community networks, and uh, we describe also what's the legal um, status at this moment, uh, access to spectrum, and uh, how are we facing difficulties, uh, especially for accessing a spectrum for uh, uh, cellular uh, community networks. We wanted, uh, or we want to uh, replicate the model from Rizomatica in Mexico, and um, yeah, we have been experiencing uh, uh, difficulties in have uh, the permission to use uh, uh, a small range of a spectrum for uh, this kind of networks. We also described um, other experiences of community networks in Colombia, 
like Bogota Mesh, uh, Red Fusa Libre, uh, Network Bogota, and um, uh, we focus a bit in the experience that we are uh, doing uh, with the support of uh, uh, other organizations like Internet Society and the work that we have been uh, doing with the Ministry of Communications and the National Spectrum Agency in how to uh, deal with the uh, difficulties of uh, building community networks in a legal framework. And um, we also uh, propose some action steps based on, on these uh, experiences. And um, uh, uh, those are uh, related uh, uh, the importance of the participation of the community itself in the uh, design, uh, implementation, and operation uh, of the model. Also, um, the use of uh, different technologies uh, in the network. We are working with uh, TV white spaces as well. Uh, in setting up uh, connectivity for to the internet, and um, also related uh, to uh, um, continue uh, pressing the uh, governments in the region, because there are a lot of uh, um, commitments from the governments. In, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, implement pilots. Uh, to prove uh, what's the need in changing of regulation and uh, to get information about how can uh, this regulation can um, um, be accord uh, or, or be um, uh, in favor of, uh, of this kind of projects. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, next author on my left. If we can please keep it to one minute each because um, we're um, getting short in time and we have 10 authors uh, to go through. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Prishai Mekbangwan. I'm from a uh, representative from the chapter from Thailand. Uh, uh, so I, I'm from internet, internet Education and Research Laboratory from the Institute of Technology. Uh, in our chapter, we talk about the deployment in uh, Tak province, which is called Taknet in Thailand. Our, uh, so our motivation is to uh, uh, allow the local people to access the internet uh, with the lower affordable cost. So uh, uh, they can access to the digital content on the internet. And uh, today we also uh, brought uh, one of our uh, key person on the local area. Uh, he, Mr. Sompon is sitting right there. So uh, yeah. yes. And uh, so uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, 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 contribution from uh, uh, many organizations like the ethnic foundation and uh, our in the lab to uh, build this community in able to happen. So I want to thank them also. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Peter, I think, raised his hand. Hello. Uh, so I'll be presenting the chapter about Mexico, uh, written by myself and Carlos Baca Feldman, who's a researcher and a member of Redis, and also Mariano Gomez, uh, who is an indigenous community member from uh, Chiapas. So uh, in this chapter, we laid out uh, the work of, of three different projects. One is um, a federated community cellular network uh, called Telecomunicaciones Indígenas Comunitarias that's been around for the last five or six years and is building uh, decentralized cellular infrastructure together with communities. Um, we also talk about uh, the intranet project that um, some folks are doing, uh, and specifically talk about the Tzeltal community of Abasola in Chiapas, which is where Mariano's from, 
So he wrote that part of the chapter and talks a bit about how they're thinking around similar things to what Nico was saying, how to create a network, but that also uh, serves the interests of the, of the community as well as allowing people to access the open internet. Uh, and then we also talk about the Techio Comunitario Training Program, uh, which a bunch of us have been running for the last year. Uh, the first group of graduates, basically the idea there was for folks from indigenous communities to be able to um, increase their skills around te the technological aspects of networking um, and also sort of doing deeper thinking about, about what uh, the purpose of the networks would be and so on. So we're actually about to do our second generation of that project. Uh, the, first, the first one is finished. Um, and I guess I will leave it there. Thanks, Peter. Okay, and the, the other authors who are here, can you raise your hand? Okay, we have one, two, three. We'll start there, go ahead. Uh, this is Roger Batch. Uh, we wrote the chapter for Catalonia, and it's about Kifinet, which is a community network that has some 10,000 of nodes, active nodes. We combine Wi-Fi and optical fiber. And what we did in our chapter is to analyze a bit our uh, policy economics and political background. Uh, and we then focus on how we scaled from tens of nodes up to tens of thousands of nodes. And we have identified some key uh, aspects. Uh, the first is uh, to very uh, precise the definition of the objectives and goals. And our goals is to uh, produce to build a stable, uh, stable uh, network for a production network. So we care about uptimes, performance, users support, etc. And then we analyze how the concept of a common pool resource help us to reach these goals. Uh, and this is directly connected to the governance of uh, common goods. Uh, and this is, there is a lot of uh, uh, um, knowledge gathered by Lena Ostrom, which is uh, very useful for us. And then we just uh, conclude with a specific uh, success story about uh, the deployment of a fiber network across a, an entire county in the north of Catalonia, which has been very successful and it's something that uh, I think it's worth to, to explain. That's it. Thank you, Roger. I think we have Maureen next. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Maureen Hernandez. Um, I'm from Venezuela. I am presenting a case that is not very successful, but all the contrary. Uh, even when we have managed to deploy um, connectivity uh, trials, and we have worked with ISAC for that, uh, it's very difficult to work in this environment because it's having, as community networks are, each one itself, it's different from any others. We are too having very different constraints. So we have divided the article into three main sections, which uh, it's uh, the economical issues or barriers, there is a public, uh, public policy framework, and at last about the freedom of expression policy framework that it's also uh, playing a key role into the connectivity. Um, at the end, we make a public call to the regulators and to the public policy, the, the, it's working in the country to work with us and to help us develop these networks, which are incredibly necessary in a country with a telecommunications infrastructure crisis. Thank you. Next author, please. Thank you very much. My name is Talant. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I saw Kyrgyz chapter. And Kyrgyzstan is a small, uh, landlocked, mountainous country in Central Asia. Uh, over 90% of our territory is above 1,000 meters. Uh, so we have many villages in the mountains which are not connected to the internet because it's really costly to bring fiber. It's not only the terrain, but also the seasonality. Uh, half the year it's snow and sometimes villages are cut off from access to civilization. So we chose one location called Su Samur. It's a touristy place in the summer and Kyrgyz people like to spend the summer there to drink uh, horse milk and to live in nomad yurts. So it's a very good tourist destination. But uh, residents in the Susamur cannot advertise their services, so they call their relatives in the capital to tell them that we have these places where you can stay. 
Uh, and uh, in the winter, because of the season, uh, often kids don't have access you know, to knowledge. So I think thanks to this community network that we are still building, hopefully uh, the situation will improve there. And one interesting lesson we also learned is uh, it wasn't our first choice. Uh, one place we wanted to build a community network, the incumbent operator did not have plans to build a fiber optic there, but once they learned that we are trying to launch a community network, they suddenly uh, became very active and brought internet. So it was good that you know, we got two villages connected with our efforts. And I'd like to thank uh, ISOC for supporting us. I, we got inspired by the network participants in Guadalajara, and later on uh, Ucha from Georgia and Osama from India came all the way to Kyrgyzstan to train us. So it was a very supportive uh, team that's helping us uh, launch this project. Thank you. Thank you, Talat. Um, can I have hands of the of authors who have not spoken? Okay, we have one, two, and and Renata. Okay, so we got uh, John, Ucha, and Renata. Okay, thank. You. Oh, hello. My name is John Dada from Nigeria, and I wrote the chapter titled the rehabilitation of a rural community network in war-torn northern Nigeria. Uh, I think that chapter illustrates two crucial points. One is the resilience of a community network, and two is the changing phase of the regulatory system in community networks. Uh, the first community network for Fansman was established 2007, and um, by 2011, when most of this infrastructure was destroyed through Boko Haram, which some of you must have heard about. A lot has changed in terms of the technology, in terms of the regulatory authorities. The authority that gave us permission in 20, 2007 wasn't the same that was to give us an, an approval when we went back this time. And we didn't know that uh, until a long time. And the other thing was, it is, it is the community that is directly affected by the insurgency that knows what it has lost. Uh, that insurgency le led to loss of lives, loss of property, uh, destruction of infrastructure. And it is only that community that can actually initiate a return to some semblance of normality. Um, the, these rural communities are so far away from government that if they were to wait until government initiative of reconstruction reaches them, they'll never get anywhere. So community network came quite handy. Fortunately, um, the hub from which the original community network was developed was still uh, active. It still had uh, its routers, it still had its um, uh, power. The power was largely solar, pa solar panel with some um, diesel generator backup. And it had a level of expertise still available because one of the consequences of the insurgency was the loss of critical manpower. Uh, people who survived this insurgency relocated to safer, safer communities to live. So our role as an organization has been this rebuilding of capacity and then renegotiating for um, the relevant permission from the authorities. Uh, because we didn't know that the authority base had changed, we were knocking on the wrong door for almost six months before we realized that we really should be talking to another authority. And the, it is, so it isn't a question of malice by the authorities, it's that um, there's been a change of <coughs> system which we were not aware of. And the new authority that gives approval for community networks seems very disposed to supporting this program now. And in fact, the last inf information I heard was that they are also uh, more favorably disposed to supporting access to TV white space. So for us, um, the support of ISOC, of APC, of uh, the African Union to ensure that the community network in our area is getting resuscitated, is beginning to yield some good results. Thank you. Thank you, John. Ucha. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm Ucha, I'm from Georgia, and uh, our part is about Pusheti Community Network. Uh, thank you, IPC, for inviting us and uh, for putting us inside of the book. Um, what can we say? Uh, it was very crucial, it was very important for this isolated society. And I can answer different one, another application of Tusheti project inside of the Georgia. There we have nine stakeholders, private sectors. One is biggest telco, so is giving some free access. And what most important is we have we got, we got some governmental funding for build community network. I think it's maybe will be interesting for other uh, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ucha. And Renata? Thank you. Um, Renata Quino Ribeiro. Uh, my chapter is about the Caribbean region and uh, on the site netcollective.wordpress.com you can uh, check some of the projects related to it. Um, and the countries that form, uh, that are part of this chapter are Barbados, Trinidad, Tobago, Dominica, Guyana, St. Vincent and Grenadines, Panama, Puerto Rico. Uh, and I am myself from the uh, Brazilian Northeastern region and working on the Northern region. And a member of the ISOC blockchain chapter. The other offers, the other, sorry, the other uh, uh, participants of this team are Rodney Taylor, Talia Mohammed, Craig Nasty, Melissa Richards, Willis Williams, Jose, Roberto de la Cruz, and Russell Beam. Um, we have had uh, community networks in different stages of implementation, and we had hurricanes, um, uh, we had uh, several situations that made uh, uh, the community networks being implemented and being re-implemented again or be moved to other places. So uh, it was uh, an, an extensive uh, time of, uh, of uh, experience and, and I hope uh, others can identify uh, how to deal with community networks in, com in natural catastrophe scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Um, can I have hands of authors that remain? Okay, we have one, two, and three. The two in the back may need to um, come forward to the microphones in the front if theirs doesn't work. Okay, we'll start with you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Eduardo Tomé. I represent uh, Red de Desarrollo Sostenible Honduras and uh, Internet Society Honduras chapter. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Internet Society for providing us the funds to deploy the network. Also, Alter Mundi and especially Nicolas uh, for all the support he provided us during the deployment and Maureen, for, Maureen Hernandez for planting us a seed after last year's like IGF in Panama. Um, well, our chapter is mostly based on our challenges since it was a, our first experience deploying a community network. We have had a, a lot of uh, experience working with communities and um, internet in general, we tried to work a lot with uh, migrants in the past, but it, this was our first experience with uh, actual networks. Um, from our experience, the community network only highlighted the ex on existing strong community bond that was already in the community, which I think is uh, a vital part in, for a successful community network. And um, we close with a statement that I would like to repeat because I think uh, it could echo strongly in these walls, which is uh, the internet cannot really be considered a global community unless every community is represented in, in it. So community networks can help us close that digital divide and finally make the internet the global community we all want it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. We have uh, Basilis from Greece. Yes. Uh, hi all, uh, my name is uh, Vasilis uh, Chrysos. I am from Greece, from the Sarantaporo.gr community network. It is a network in, uh, that um, provides uh, internet connectivity to 11 remote isolated villages in uh, rural Greece. It started back in 2008 by a company of guys 
who felt that, um, who uh, just realized that uh, their village did not have internet connectivity, and they decided to do a critical question. What can we do about this? These were a group of young guys who had no idea about what a community network is, how to build one, uh, but they had the, uh, the willing and the willingness to help uh, and to do something about their village, and this is how it all started. Uh, gradually, it became a network that provides co connectivity to 11 villages in the area, uh, 3,500 people, and um, we are feeling more and more uh, closer to the global community of uh, community networks, thanks to all of you guys and uh, thanks to uh, our participation and uh, the help that we have received from many organizations like uh, ISOC and others. Um, three basic um, ingredients have uh, helped us develop our community network, which is infrastructure, the building of the lo local community, and the education and training of the local uh, uh, local uh, citizens, local uh, uh, stakeholders. So this is what we are laying down in our description uh, of our chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, where did that other author? Yes, please, Osama. So actually, uh, Ritu, my colleague, wrote the chapter, but since she's not here, I thought that I will speak on her behalf. Uh, so community networks, uh, you know, the chapter has covered the last eight to nine years of journey. We had started in 2009 with the help of uh, Internet Society, and we have continued in eight phases in the last uh, nine, uh, nine years, various phases of taking uh, community networks in various parts of the country. Uh, unfortunately, India has got about 600,000 villages. Perhaps we need as many networks, as many community networks. So all the other 43 chapters need to come to India to help us to get them going. But there are three things that we learned. One is that uh, we could build uh, expertise and uh, the technical community within the village and within the community who can look after the uh, networks. The second thing, uh, we influence the government to actually uh, recognize our effort and announce a uh, public Wi-Fi hotspot system for all over the country. So they are now going into 50,000 and plus number of villages which will have uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. And the third thing is that they have also released some bands on, uh, you know, five megahertz, which is in very interesting. So even at a village level, if you are going to get connected, you are going to get connected anywhere in any village you go. So they are back-end database, uh, you know, integrating with uh, all the telcos. Um, and the fourth good thing is that government has decided to go in all the villages with the broadband and further allowing with various people to take the connectivity and further distribute. Uh, you know, it's it's being said and, uh, you know, being implemented but not really going forward in a very strong manner. But uh, what we are seeing is that what we need in India is a scale of community networks and that is the uh, need of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other authors uh, who would like to speak? Okay, uh, Renata, you would like to speak again? <laughs> I was told I have to speak again because there was a glitch, a technical glitch. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, I am Renata Kino Ribeiro. My chapter is about the Caribbean region, the Task Force for Latin American and Caribbean Community Connectivity, TFLAC Free, inspired on the DC Free. And uh, uh, we had the following uh, members of the task force, Rodney Taylor from the Barbados chapter, Talia Mohamed from the Trinidad and Tobago chapter, Craig Nasty from the Dominica chapter, Melissa Richards from Guyana chapter, and Willis Williams from St. Vincent Grenadines, Jose Roberto de la Cruz, Puerto Rico chapter, and Russell Bean, Panama chapter. Our community networks were in various different stages of implementation, and most of them were in SID small islands developing countries. 
and were affected by hurricanes and other natural catastrophes. So it could be a good resource for those in the same situation. Okay, thanks very much. I think at this time we can uh, open up to the floor if there are any um, participants that would like to pose a question to um, one of the authors or um, to the either in the country, region, or thematics. I open the floor up. Um, you can just raise your hand. I'll take the first three. Okay, it appears everyone's speechless and just blown away with this excellent edition of um, Gifts Watch, which is great. Um, well, what I'd like to do then is... Um, there is a question on the back there. Oh, sorry. Okay, there is a question. Uh, if you can speak in the mic, uh, your name and uh, your organization. Yes. I think the microphones are working in the inner circle, so you'll need to step <laughs> forward. Hello, this is uh, Guy Iribarren from Altermundi. I'm definitely blown away by the publication. Uh, thank you very much. My question is, uh, are there any plans to keep this updated, as this will hopefully be growing every time more? And what are the plans? <laughs> They're pointing to me. I don't know why <laughs> to answer. But look, no, I'm just. Uh, well, uh, Guess Watch has different themes every year, so it will definitely. It could be, um, could be a special edition, but I think that one of the things that might come out of this would be that there would definitely be a lot more um, things to document, I would say, and to write about. So I'm pretty sure that there will, something will come out in what form and when and where. I have no idea at the moment. <laughs> uh, yes, and in regards to Giswatch, perhaps not, but we also, this is part of a larger uh, project, the local access project, and um, ongoing research is being done and research outputs will come out of um, this being one of the, the research outputs. So maybe not in the form of GIS watch, but in other um, uh, forms. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a question online. Here, here. Uh, by the remote. Oh, okay, Seba I, yes, Sebastian so. has a question coming remotely. Um, he's our remote uh, yeah, moderator, uh, please Tamara go ahead. Shu from Egypt. Uh, are you prepared to talk? Um, he wants to know, like, he wants to talk about... Tamara, can you listen to me? Hello. Can you speak right now? Tamara? No, it seems that it's not working. Yeah, let me. Perhaps the uh, speaker can, uh, the remote um, participant can uh, type out their, their question and then we can um, have the opportunity to, to answer it. Yes, I will try. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, is there anyone else um, that would like to make a comment uh, who's here on site? Okay, in the meanwhile, uh, hopefully we can get the uh, remote uh, participant to, to speak, but uh, what we'd like to do is um, the editions uh, will be available online as well on www giswatch.org um, slash community networks. Sorry, um, Carlos, you're raising your hand. Is there yeah. something you'd like to say? Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, that is a, a, an answer to, to Guy. Uh, and maybe in relation to the work that uh, Eric, Carla, and, and Luca have been doing, and Carlos, uh, in 2016, I did a map of community networks in Africa, and I put all the content or those that I identified in Wikipedia, uh, or we did with my colleague Michael Kraft. Maybe that's something that um, that the current study on Latin America can do, and maybe that's something that we can easily 
do from from these chapters just to add them to the to the Wikipedia entry on on community networks in in, in around the world. Uh, I think it takes some maintenance to to you know ongoing updating which ones are still active, which you know which the level of detail that we want to include about all of them. But this if it's just name and website, maybe that's that could be something. I don't know how far you've gone onto the Latin American one. Please, Eric, go ahead. Yes, uh, well, regarding that question, uh, on this site that is in our website, www.redesac.org.mx. Uh, um, so in, in that website, we, we will try to keep the information for Latin America, at least. And the idea is like, we it's, it's part of a, the, not only the, the regulatory part, but also economic and sustainable part of it. Also experiences that cases that people want to contribute could be there. So that's, that's, uh, that, that would be maintained during, well, indefinitely. Thank you. Valeria? Yeah, just to announce that in, um, uh, we are going to be collaborating with our member Derechos Digitales to a comp to do a comparative reflection, but not comparative, but a reflection of, uh, of the Latin American reports of Giz Watch from a rights perspective uh, of this year to, to, to be able to uh, contribute to the section on dealing with access of the Latin America in a glimpse, a publication that is going to be presented at the Internet Freedom Forum in Valencia. So that's another use of, of, of the reports that we will do and we'll be liaising with the with the authors of the of the chapters to be able to use that content in that way. Let me go back to Sebastian to see if he was able to reach our remote uh, participant. Okay, unfortunately not. At this time, I just want to also acknowledge the GISWatch advisory team who were integral for uh, spending their time to help us um, produce this uh, project. We'd also like to thank um, ISOC, uh, Jane Coffin and uh, Colin Muller, who assisted us with um, some of the interviews uh, in the in two book chapters, and um, and helping them to prepare their chapters. Um, I hope all of you um, have a chance to have a copy of the book where we've distributed um, them, and I think there's still a few more. Um, so if you haven't picked up a copy, feel free to pick up a copy as well as some of our previous editions. Um, at the APC booth, we also have uh, USB sticks which have all of the editions of the of the gifts watch for the last uh, 12 uh, annual editions. So um, feel free to stop by the booth to pick that up. We also have a few here if you'd like to, uh, to, to have a USB. And um, also, we'd like to invite you all to the APC party this evening. Um, uh, you can get information at the booth uh, about that. So just in closure, I'd like to thank you all, uh, um, the speakers, the authors, for creating this um, edition, uh, being part of the conversation um, that's happening at the IGF around community networks. Uh, Carlos mentioned the rise, the fall, and the rise of community networks. and. Uh, in their chapter and that hopefully this will be uh, the point where uh, they can make it and uh, not fall again. So and on that note, I'd like to close and thank you all for participating.